And it goes back to, again, making the invisible visible. I think there are certain things in our lives that we are committed to that we don't even fully acknowledge or recognize. Welcome to the Bro Novo Podcast, the podcast that models healthy communication for men. Empowering them to start the journey of self-work. Now here's your host, Thomas Pierce. Hello everybody, welcome to the show. This week I have an awesome conversation with Jeff Siegel. Jeff is a health and wellness coach based in Massachusetts. This is definitely more of the classic Bro Nouveau style, so talking a lot about Jeff's approach to being a good man, what that means to him. And he brings up this really interesting concept of mature masculinity, which I found to be very interesting. Enjoy the show. And we're live. Morning, Jeff. How you doing, man? Good morning, Thomas. Happy to be here. Going over your content and your website, a lot of the messaging I interpreted from your your website was around getting away from feeling bad, right? It's interesting because I think a lot of people think about coaching or physical fitness and think maybe about like peak performance or like, how do I get my dream body? But it seems like you're more working with almost a little more reality based. It's like, okay, like a lot of people because of our food system, because of how hard they work or whatever other reasons don't feel good. And we need to get them back to a baseline first before we go up to trying to build a dream physique almost. Yeah. I I think the key part there is that it's a, it's a process. I believe there is, a certain developmental process with steps that everybody needs to take. And if you're coming from a place of, of pain, like if your body is in pain, like if you've ever had chronic pain, like that just is overwhelming. Like you can't do anything. You can't think about anything else because the pain masks whatever you're doing. So like first step is like, yeah, we need to get your body out of pain. Right. And similarly, like if you're coming from um, a place of like general unwellness and whether that's with your metabolism uh, or, you know, psychologically just in a place of depression or anxiety, you know, it's like, yeah, we need to, we need to pull ourselves back to a place of balance. And then once we have that set up and the right foundation, then we can start building upon that towards higher levels of performance. Uh, but I think, you know, it, it's, it's doing people a disservice. A lot of the languaging in the health and wellness world of, you know, uh, just like it, we, 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 we paint this picture of what it's like to be, you know, this, this perfect, um, you know, representation of like a fit body and, and great mental health and like, you know, just like crushing life in, in every dimension, <laughs> you know, like there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, but like that might be the end goal, but that's not necessarily the means to get there. And if we immediately try to jump to the end without taking the necessary steps, like it's going to fall apart. And, I, and I'm sure people, you know, have experienced some of this before where it's like, you know, you jump on a new thing, you try to like drastically change everything in your life and it feels really great for a couple of weeks. And then a month or two later, you're basically back to where you started. Right. So I, I, taking more of a stepwise approach, I find just to be way more sustainable. Absolutely. The biggest one for me on that spectrum of sustainable change versus versus not sustainable is around diet. So lifelong, I'm a lifelong athlete. I love being active. That's my, one of my main outlets for relieving stress. Mm. And so I'll go and do a like ferocious workout, you know, five days a week, but then it's been a whole process to learn discipline around nutrition and actually think about, all right, what is this fuel I'm putting in my body? And that was a big one for me is thinking about the body as a machine. Your website talks about how our body is a system you know, if it's a system, what are we, what are the components we're putting into it? If it's a machine, what kind of fuel are we, you know, providing it? Yeah. And so I think, again, kind of thinking about these different levels for a lot of people out there, food is not something they typically really think about. You know, I talk about the, the, uh, the big C's that actually control most people's eating, right? And that's convenience is like probably number one, just going to eat whatever is easy, comfort, which is just like, I'm going to eat what's, what's familiar and comfortable to me and, and pleasant mm. and pleasurable culture as in my culture and my tradition and my upbringing and my family, like they kind of have influenced what I like to eat or know how to eat and therefore is going to play into that. And then cost, 
play makes a huge a huge role for so many of our food decisions. Um, and so the whole idea of like eating for for health or for wellness is on the margins. So I think it's like the first step is again getting people to think about you know what are you putting into your body um, and how is that affecting you? You know, not just physically, but affecting your mood, uh, your ability to concentrate. And then, as you said, you know, so that's where like most people start learning a little bit about nutrition, a little bit about fitness. And because that's embedded in our kind of Western medicalized model, like we, then we tend to kind of take this machine approach. Okay, like food is fuel. And certainly like if you're doing endurance sports, like, yes, I think that actually is a very accurate and, and helpful perspective to take. If you're doing a three hour bike ride, like you need to think about proper fueling and hydration for that. But then at a certain point, you kind of run up to the limitations of this food is fuel thing. And, and you have to come out on the other end of that at an even higher level. As I said, of you know, thinking about your body as this like dynamic uh, unfolding, you know, system that's alive. Right. And, and it's not just a machine, although there are elements of it to it that are behave like that. But there's there's more than that. And so I often say, you know, food is, is energy and information. We can't get lost in just one or the other, right? So like the energy crowd says like all that matters is calories and macros and just like, you know, mm. get your macros, right? Like your body will be happy and fine, right? But, um, you know, you can have two foods, right? That are like the same amount of calories, right? You can have like a donut that's 150 calories um, and you can have a handful of almonds that's 150 calories. Energy is the same, but the information contained in those foods is very, very different. The mm -hmm. almond has all of the information in it needed to actually grow an entire new almond tree. Like it's an amazing amount of genetic information in there. And, and that's going to influence how your body metabolizes, assimilates it and what it does with that versus the donut, which, you know, who knows what information is in the donut. <laughs> so yeah. Processed sugar. Yeah. That's cool, man. I, I had a teacher, I was taking a breathing course and she talked about, you know, the, the prana, the energy in food. And she said, think about putting a pumpkin on a table compared to a piece of raw meat. And three weeks from now, what are those two things going to look like if you just leave them alone? And think about how that affects your body and, and what goes on inside of your body. I totally agree. And I like that, man. Another one I, that I like too is around eggs, right? Like I had a nutrition teacher who was talking about eggs because eggs with the cholesterol, they get, you know, that mixed reviews. But she said, think about it, people. There is all of the material and information needed for new life in that egg. Like, Do you think that there's nothing of value in there? Like, Absolutely there is. There's an incredible amount of, again, genetic information in that, in that egg. Yeah. I'm a big, I'm a big fan of, of eggs. You know, if you don't have an allergy to them, I know some people do have some sensitivities or other things, but, um, you know, I think you, you raise an important thing about the, God, the, the current dietary landscape in the United States is like borderline insane. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like that's, I don't, I don't know any other way to put it. Right. It's, it's, there, there is a, there's a great book out there about like diet cults, you know, and, and I often make this analogy to religion and in, in the way in which people become these evangelists for particular diets, right? Like that, that vegan that won't stop telling you that you should be a vegan uh, right. or the gluten-free guy who's always <laughs> to give up your bread, right? Or the paleo guy that says you should never touch a carb or even a bean because it has, you know, anti-nutrients in it and things like that. And so it's like, it gets very dogmatic and we, we really kind of isolate ourselves in these things. And, and uh, I'm not blaming anybody for that. You know, I think it's, it's, it's just, it's a really confusing landscape. There's a lot of different information, misinformation, um, as, as I'm a huge fan of the sciences in general to like point us towards, you know, reliable truths, but nutrition as a science is fraught with all sorts of problems. Uh, you know, a lot of the scientific studies are really small sample sizes. They're looking at really limited biomarkers. I mean, it's really, it's hard mm -hmm. to control somebody's diet unless you lock them in a room, you know, and, and feed them every single possible thing. And then you're constantly taking measures. And obviously, you know, there's a lot of limitations to running studies like that. So most diet studies tend to be very correlational. And most people are horrible about reporting accurately what they eat or didn't eat. Right. You know? So even the sciences don't offer us as a robust, you know, insight into these things. 
and it's hard and everybody's different. It's, it's a tricky landscape there. I don't, I don't know what, how, like where you've landed for yourself. It sounds like you're, you're, you're navigating that as, as we all are. Right. Yeah, for sure. And that's really interesting about the, the sample sizes and yeah, that makes total sense. The other thing that probably is a huge problem in those is that everyone's bodies reacts differently to things and everyone has different genetics how they process food, where the energy goes, fat goes in their body, you know, what kind of yeah genetics they're bringing with them. For sure. I, I just think about what makes my body feel good and how do I feel after I eat? You know, if I'm, if I'm getting ready for a specific event, like a, a triathlon or I'm playing rugby, I might change my, try to bulk up or bulk down or lean, lean out a little bit. But yeah, so food, I mean, that's really interesting is a big part of your origin story as well, reading about your experience as a teenager. And that's one of the things I definitely would love to to ask you to share if you could, just to kind of give some perspective to people about, you know, where you came from and kind of what you overcame and how it informed this this passion of yours around nutrition and, and wellness. Yeah. So, you know, it's like I I love food. I love I love eating food. I love thinking about, you know, the ways in which food and nutrition and um, act as this beautiful intersection of industry and commerce and and nature and mind and body and spirit. And, you know, I I think the the so much happens at the the dining room table (laughs) that can be either incredibly life giving and health promoting or it can be horribly the otherwise. Uh, mm-hmm. But I, I, I didn't come to this place, you know, out of out of nothing. It really, yeah, it began as a teenager. What started in me restricting food, ignoring my hunger, almost like thinking I was above my hunger. There was a bit of this sort of like superhuman aspect of like, well, you know, yeah, like I can just go the whole day without eating. Like there's something really manly or prideful in that. You know, little did I know that that was the the early signs of an eating disorder that that would eventually blossom into like a full blown mind body civil war, as I like to kind of refer to it now in hindsight, where there was this little voice in my head that was like, don't eat this, uh, do eat that, you know, and, and really what it was saying, you're only allowed, you're only allowed to not only eat this, but to feel this, right? And mm-hmm. ultimately, you know, food became a symbolic substitute for me trying to control my inner world, my emotional and psychological state, probably because I felt like there was a lot in my outer world that I couldn't control. You know, I think as, as a young teenager, recognizing how big the world was and how small my part was in it, you know, and that a lot of life was outside of my capacity to do anything about. I was like on a path that was chosen for me by my parents and my upbringing. And, you know, there was a lot of inherited baggage with all of that. And, um, I think coming to that realization kind of scared the hell out of some part of me, which, you know, and for whatever which way manifested in in an uh, in eating disorder that, you know, forced me to drop out of high school because I got to the point where I was so sick. I was so thin. I was so frail. I was so malnourished. I, I was tired and cold. And, you know, there's all these kind of classic eating disorder uh, symptoms. But it was it was hitting that low point as a teen and then having a really robust you know, I'm so thankful that my family didn't give up on me and, and my friends, you know, were just there to support me. And so kind of climbing myself out of that dark hole. And and in the process, there was some part of me that truly wanted to be healthy and happy and and what kind of on a mission to learn whatever I could about about mind, about body, and obviously about that intersection of nutrition. And so that kind of has has paved my path since then in terms of what I have studied both formally in, in college and graduate school and then informally on, in my own and then in practice now, uh, you know, helping others. Fantastic. Well, I applaud you for sharing so openly and I'm also very happy that you came through that. And it's something that very similar to suicide in a family or depression, serious anxiety, addiction, I believe that eating disorders are very common, but are not discussed. There's not a lot of light shed on them. There's a bit of a, of a taboo around them. Mm. So I applaud you for sharing so openly. And I'm sure that this message will get to someone who needs to hear it. So yeah, that's I mean, awesome. It, it's especially, you know, I'll bring in the, the 
gender identity, right? Like I, I, I definitely hear you. I think there is a lot of what I would call disordered eating out there that may or may not, you know, qualify under the DSM criteria as an eating disorder per se. But yeah, there, you know, I think a lot of people struggle with food and with their and with their body and um, and it manifests in in weird little compulsions and power moves and and a lot of you know fighting with themselves in their own head, you know, playing these little games. Yeah, and then and, and I think especially as as a male, it's something that's definitely not really talked about or discussed. You know, eating disorders typically, you know, is thought of as sort of like a, a female disease. And it makes me think of like how underdiagnosed maybe it is. If you do struggle with eating in certain ways, like it's A, that's like it's normal and B, it's you're not alone. And uh, C, it's it's okay to like ask and, and reach out for help. 100%. We're all about that here on the on the podcast. So that's a nice pivot towards just more of a of a wide angle observation of yourself and masculinity and in my masculine masculinity that's kind of the bread and potatoes of of the show so one of the things i've identified in uh <laughs> in conversations recently is that you know in this quest for discovering a healthy masculinity it's helpful to have a goal and society generally doesn't give us a goal you know some cultures they have coming of age rituals or there there are kind of clear doctrines of for hey kids this is what you're going for as an adult but at least in in the United States you know for me and, and my family there wasn't a lot of that so you know when you wake up in the morning what is it that you say to yourself about your values about how you move through the world kind of what are the things that inform your decisions and how you approach interactions with people yeah. I mean, I, I think just the first part I want to comment on is that I I think we need to take very seriously like the disappearance of these cultural rituals around initiating boys into manhood, you know, and, and same for, for girls into womanhood. As you said, like most, you know, if you look at most traditional cultures around the world, like there is always, you know, at least one, if not many different processes, whether that was a a bar bat mitzvah in the, you know, or, or some sort of um, more like a test of, of, you know, people's ability mm-hmm. to survive in the wilderness um, sometimes involved, you know, different sorts of psychedelic medicines. I mean, you know, there, there was this sort of coming of age thing. I think we've, we've done ourselves a disservice uh, by kind of shunning those or let allowing our more, you know, kind of mainstream secular culture to push those to the to the periphery, and, and and what's gone in its place is patriarchy, right? The the social and cultural organization that has ruled the Western world for for most uh, you know so much of history. And I see you know patriarchy is really this expression of kind of this immature masculine energy. Or you know, there's a great book uh, I, I suggest. It's called uh, King warrior, magician, lover. And, and it really talks about the archetypes of mature masculinity in it. And it says, you know, sort of the opposite of mature masculinity is what it talks about is like boy psychology. <laughs> you know, it's just sort of this like stunted masculine. It's, it's, it's totally stuck in these immature levels. And then I think a lot of us are stuck, <laughs> you know, and myself included. And, you know, and, and this isn't a unitary thing. I think this is where it gets tricky. Whereas like some parts of our lives, we can be very mature. And then there are other parts where we can be very immature. You know, this is something that I've been wrestling with myself. You know, I think I have been fortunate to develop a great deal of like emotional maturity um, as a process of of learning a lot about my mind and body and different practices to do with that. But then, you know, I'm working like my own issues around like, like money, you know, I feel like more stunted there, right? So if you like take these big buckets emotions, money, you know, sexuality, uh, morality, like you can, you can kind of parse it apart and, and, and get a more granular look and ask like, yeah, like where, where do I feel sort of stuck in these more immature, juvenile, you know, boyish ways of thinking about these things and where have I evolved? Absolutely. And as, as we're talking, I kind of came to a little realization that in place of that ritual, like the ritual for Americans is basically you know, how early can you leave the nest and become financially solvent or independent, mm. you know, which is, which is, has its merit. Absolutely. It's a functioning adult needs to be able to take care of themselves ideally. Yes. But 
it also gets into this thing that you acknowledged with the systems in place and who who is most likely to succeed in the systems of becoming financially independent who gets the interviews who is the gatekeeper of of the access to these resources and you know we know from our cultural discourse from kind of a, a raised awareness that it's you know the white men who are the gatekeepers in these organizations and these corporations a lot of the time and that's changing but you know if that's if that's the pivotal cornerstone coming of age ritual and it's largely slanted to one group mm. that's that's an issue you know that's not that's not an ideal system yeah and and, and the big question on my mind is like how do i a evolve myself you know and really enact this mature masculinity in the world and then b how do i help others cuz that's that's a huge part of my my mission and, and my work, you know, and, and I kind of choose wellness as the path to help people empower themselves to do that. Cause I, I think ultimately like coming back, taking better care of your body teaches you so much um, about how to be a more mature man or woman in society. It's really tricky. I think the other part is like, you know, we don't have a lot of really good role models out there, but there's not, there's not a ton of, mm-hmm. you know, fantastic platforms to, to look towards and be like, oh yeah, that's, that's what it looks like. That's where we're headed. You know, I think it's easier for us to look back in the other direction and, and say like, oh, this is what we don't want. Right. It's, I mean, you know, it's, it's pretty clear what we don't want. You know, I think we've come to at least that realization for the most part in mainstream America, Mm -hmm. like the ways in which that sort of, you know, white supremacist, you know, patriarchal form of masculinity or, or just, social identity is is so destructive right so we're like yeah we, we we don't want more of that but what what do we want is still kind of up for debate absolutely and i'll, I'll take a stab at it i think that if i were a parent and i was raising a, a boy i would say things along the lines of observe observe the men in your life right because ideally i'm gonna have friends and relatives who are good men who make people feel good. They lift them up when they come in the room. The energy in the room is the same or better when they enter and not kind of creates tension or someone who comes into the room and everyone else in the room gets a little tight or they know this person's flammable because they have a short temper or they're violent. And, you know, I would kind of go that direction of, of ask the boys, you know, what kind of, what kind of person do you want to be in this world? What kind of, presence do you want to have in the room and how do you want to make people feel? Do you want to make people feel seen and heard and like safe to express themselves? Because that is all, that's a conscious development. Even if it's not with a bad intent, kind of has to take a more elevated mindset of, okay, I'm interacting to use, to use you an example. Like I'm interacting with Jeff right now. He's on my podcast. This is our longest conversation we've ever had. Am I, am I making him feel comfortable to speak? And feel like he can speak his mind without being shut down and I'm not interrupting him. You know, all of those things apply to everyday conversations and, you know, that's kind of a more very active thought process of how do I make people feel seen and heard? And that's something we have to teach kids. So that, that was, that'd be one thing that I, you know, if I ever have kids and one thing I would try to instill, I suppose. Yeah. Super important there. I, I love that you bring up the, the kind of, parent child dynamic. I I think, I think so much of this really begins within the, within the family and looking at that nuclear family unit, you know, we're talking about manhood or a mature masculinity, like it can really flourish or crumble, like in that relationship between your significant other, your partner, whether that's your wife or somebody else, um, you know, and, and in how you decide to, to parent your kids, if, if you have children, you know, I think that that speaks so many volumes to it. And I, and I love what you're saying about, yeah, you know, it's like, you know, there, there, there are many, many wonderful, amazing, good, mature men out there, right? So I don't want to claim that, like, we're all stuck in this, like, boy psychology and, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and so, yeah, I think you can, you can point to the, you know, and say, and, and, and really highlight those character strengths. And, and, it, and it, yeah, there's this, this act of grooming and cultivating that in others. And, and you said a big part of it is allowing people to feel seen and heard and validated and welcomed. And, and for me, it's like welcoming all parts of you. 
I don't want just the one mask of masculinity that you're used to putting out totally. in the world, right? And and I see that can be so true, you know, for so many guys of like, you know, they're they're used to showing up in this sort of one way, you know, when they're hanging out, like they're this one sort of dude, right? And that that may or may not be authentic to them, but the question is like, there's always more, right? Like we're we're complex, multifaceted individuals, and so like I always like that's my desire is like I want to see more, and I want you I want you to feel comfortable enough to to show more. And again, like that's a certain vulnerability that I think typical kind of patriarchal culture doesn't promote or even accept for men to to be able to show that. Absolutely, it's it's looked down upon, and it's actively discouraged. And it's interesting to see what happens when, you know, I bring this up with people, obviously on the podcast, I'm talking to people who have an active interest in this, in this line of conversation, but bringing it up with strangers or or buddies, I know it's really interesting because it kind of either pivots, like there's either a wall, a further wall that goes up of kind of doubling down on the mask a little bit, or people see the opportunity and they're like, Oh my gosh, <laughs> this is a dude who is comfortable hearing me out actually. And I don't have to be stoic. I don't have to pretend like everything's okay. And it's pretty amazing, man, because I'm sure you've had this too, but you know, when someone says to you something along the lines of, I've never told anyone this in my life, but X, Y, Z comes out like that is like a, Oh my God moment. You know, it's like this person has never told anyone this. And I just asked, being curious and applying a little empathy and like this river of emotion and stories and pent up information comes out. I don't know if you're familiar with um, the like authentic relating community or, or Mm -hmm. circling, you know, but yeah, I mean, there's a group of people out there that are, that are really in my mind kind of pushing the edge of developing like these interpersonal practices Right, putting some real like guidelines and, and practices in place for like, yeah, how can we relate to each other at this more intimate level? Because it takes a lot of courage, right? Again, to be vulnerable. A lot of us don't have any real training or education in it. We don't even know where to begin. It's helpful to have some structure, you know, in the beginning of, of like, how do you actually get started with having these, these types of conversations with people if that's something that you desire? One of the things they say is that, you know, when, when you become more interested, people become more interesting. Mm. Right. And I think a lot Absolutely. of the basic part of just asking questions, like really allowing your own curiosity to come out, you know, and I see this in myself, especially with, with family or close friends is like a lot of times we, we shy away from asking, you know, perhaps part of us assumes that we already know. You're like, I know this person. I've known them for so long. Like but the problem is when, when we start, when we stop asking, you know, we're not getting any new information about where this person is, what they're thinking, what, what are they going through? Like, where are they at right now? And, and instead what we're doing is we're just making assumptions. We're making a hell of a lot of assumptions and guesses about who we think they are. And at that point, like we're no longer seeing them. We're not really relating to the person that is in front of us. We're relating to this idea we have of them based upon all these past beliefs and interactions about who we think they are. And this happens to all of us, you know, and it's just part of the ways our brains are made and these kind of cognitive heuristic shortcuts that they take. And and it isn't necessarily a bad thing, but when that becomes our sole way of relating to each other, we lose, we lose so much in the process. Absolutely. And so to pivot to relationships and marriage and how men, I mean, we're, we're speaking about straight men here, but I think there probably is some overlap too to other kind of sexualities and, and gender identities. So you're married and you're obviously conscious, pursuing a conscious path. You think about things, you care about these things. So when you're in your reflections on your relationship, what would you say are some of your strengths that you can bring and, and things you've noticed that go well when applying these thought processes? And if you have any edges, what are they? And, and what do you think those implications could be for other guys out there who yeah. may have similar edges? Yeah. You know, I think say my, my relationship with my wife is the, the most beautiful and the most difficult laboratory <laughs> of, of my personal development. When it's going well, it's amazing. And when it's not going well, it's horrible. And, and the question is like, is there a commitment on both ends to, to stick with it, right? And to, 
to learn from it and to grow through it. You know, in, in, in particular things, I think that, again, because of the nature of my work and my journey, like I, I have a lot of tools. Like I am a highly resourced guy when it comes to the ability to, you know, handle difficult emotions and, you know, my training in, in mindfulness and meditation and as well as physical training, like, you know, I have so much awareness of my body and, and how to enter into difficult conversations. Um, but I'm still not great at it. Like there are times where like, I, I would totally give myself an, an F <laughs> in how I do. Uh, yeah. I don't, I don't want to claim that um, I'm some sort of uh, perfect person in any possible way. I think the real difference is the intentionality. Like there is, times where I will go into the conversation with such a clear, beautiful intention of being present, of being receptive, of, of just opening my heart and, and asking good questions. And, uh, you know, similar to what I do when, when I'm coaching, but if I I can do that with my wife, um, it invites in that, that level of intimacy that is, you know, can be so wonderful. Now I'll say there's a caveat there of like, you can show up and you can do all that. And guess what? The other person may still not be interested, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, like it takes two to tango. So even if I show up in this really like present, open, vulnerable way, she might not be in the place where she can do that. And so that can be hard, but I also need to like, I need to, you know, you just need to roll with that and you need to accept that. And so then I need to ask, I'm like, you know, what, what do you need right now? Do you need some space? Do you need some alone time? Um, you know, is there a better time? Is there something I can do to to help you be you um, in that place, right? And so the, the intentionality around coming together is important. And and I think the flip side of that has been, you know, COVID, both of us, uh, you know, working from home, you know, sharing a space, spending so much time together is, is very easy to fall into more mindless, more unconscious habits, you know, and, and when this happens, again, we're not really seeing each other. We're sort of seeing this sort of like projection of each other that we think we know. And, uh, and that leads to a lot of, you know, unconscious reactions and like, you know, saying things without really thinking about the implications or the impact and, uh, and, you know, can very easily start to wear, wear each other thin. Absolutely. Again, thank you for the honesty and the vulnerability. You know, all of these questions are requiring you to be, you know, transparent and that's, what we're trying to do here on the podcast, right? Is just normalize this. So again, I applaud you and thank you. And I can totally relate. I'm in a new ish relationship, you know, less than a year. And I had previously not been in one for like three years, which when you're 25 is a lot of your life. (laughs) And there are times when I am upset about something. And even though I have all of these tools in my toolbox, if I'm upset and I feel I'm not being seen or heard, then I, I, I really struggle to apply them. So I guess the caveat here is that with all of these things we're talking about, we're all human. And it's less of a look at us and how cool we are. It's more of a, no, this is like a lifelong endeavor. And we are just trying because if we don't try, at least for me, I'm trying because I feel that if I don't try and be conscious about these things, I'm going to ultimately fail inevitably, because it's so easy to fail. It's such a challenging thing to be someone who operates with integrity and thinks about how I affect other people and, and care about, you know, my, how I move through the world and how I affect other people. Yeah. And, and I appreciate you for saying that and for, and for having that as, you know, part of your life agenda. <laughs> I'm not sure if everybody does. And that, that's, a, that's an open question that I have on my mind. You know, obviously, like both of us are very steeped in kind of the world of, of personal development. And like, you know, we, we deeply we, we want to grow up. Right. Like, you know, we're having this conversation. Right. We want to be you know, <laughs> we want to be more of this sort of mature, you know, masculine uh, energy. But I think that, you know, I, I don't know whether, you know, that's true universally. And, and and I'm not sure what the block is, whether it's education or comfort or ignorance or you know, what it is. And, and, you know, I, I think there's a certain, perhaps developmental, a certain type of privilege, right, that puts us both in a place. And again, this go back to mm-hmm. us being white men uh, of a certain education and class level, you know, where mm-hmm. we, you know, have the awareness of like, oh, yeah, like, it, it, this is important, right? Like, psycho emotional development is important. You know, life isn't just about survival and 
you know, earning your next paycheck and then, you know, getting really drunk on the weekends, you know, like you can do that mm-hmm. too. Like that's, that's, that's fine. But like, there's more, but I think it, it takes a certain, you know, I, I, you know, type of uh, life path to, to realize that there's more and then to want to pursue it. Absolutely. Great call on the privilege component of it. It's an abs- absolutely a privilege that I can sit here and discuss this, right? Cause I'm not in the, the grind for survival particularly, right? Like I am obviously everyone needs to work and take care of themselves, but great, great call out. The other thing too, that I, I wanted to bring up with your discussion of how you approach interactions with your wife, there's a way of conceptualizing interacting with other people that really made it click for me to, to visualize it, which is the idea of meeting someone where they're at. Right. So imagine being in a room and then in order to have a productive conversation, you know, you have to walk halfway across the room to that line, physically going there and meeting someone where they are instead of saying, why can't she come here? Why can't he come over here and talk to me where I'm at? You know, it's, it's, that one was really useful for me and realizing, okay, like everybody has their own stuff on their plate and maybe I need to act with a little more empathy instead of saying, what was me? Why aren't they doing exactly what I want? Yeah, that's great. You know, I, I think that's that's an act of of love, of caring. When you when you have the awareness and the attention, and then the ability to go meet somebody where they're at, and say like, "Hey, like I notice X, Y, Z. You know, how are you doing? You know, just like yeah. I'm here for you, right?" Um, another really useful kind of relational framework that has been helpful for me comes from. Uh, this neuroscientist, Dan, Dan Siegel, who same last name, no relation, <laughs> but I love, I love that <laughs> work. Um, you know, and he talks about the concept of Mui, which I, I don't, I don't love the name of this, but the idea is that like there, there is, there is me. Right. And it's like, and when we're thinking about relationship, right. There's like, there's Jeff and then there, there is my wife, you know, and we each have our own individual lives and careers. And, and it's important, like we, we need our own sense of individuality, right? Like that autonomy and the fact that like I have a life that is mine is important. Um, and I think sometimes when people come together, you know, whether it's through marriage or something else, then that, that individuality begins to get enmeshed into this concept of we, all right? So it's like, oh, it's not just me now, it's, it's we. Right. And so and and yes, like the we is very important because like we're sharing a life, we're building a future together, we're we're you know living in a home, we've got shared responsibilities, like so like making collaborative decisions as a we is is essential. Right. But the challenge is like if you're all we and you lose your sense of me, right? Like you 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 can get a little bit ungrounded, you can lose your own direction. Right. Or the flip side, if like you're all me and there is no we, it's like both people are very self-centered and narcissistic. Right. And and the relationship doesn't <laughs> often work very well. And so the, the integrated space, right, is this concept of we, right, which is like we can be together as a we unit and we can preserve our own individuality as a me. All right. But we're not sacrificing one for the other. And I think that, in my mind, is really the sort of the, the goal to get towards is to find what that balance is and, and how can you support your partner in their own autonomy? And then also, are you, are you doing your job? And I think for men, especially because of the kind of patriarchy, we, we depend upon the women in our lives for so many things. Like when we think about the we space, you know, like the women, there's so much invisible labor, <laughs> right? Emotionally or otherwise that women do to maintain that sense of we and the guy just kind of shows up and gets to enjoy it. And that's not fair. So like, as you know, I think part of becoming a mature man is, is really asking like, yeah, are you, are you doing everything you can be doing to support that container of your relationship? Um, You know, I think those are, those are important things to keep in mind. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think what you just talked about the emotional labor piece, the contract, I think that most men were sold is that Go make the money. This is maybe a previous generation, but provide stability financially, and then you are absolved of all other responsibilities. And so the, that more mature masculinity that we've been talking about is probably where these other components come in of actually being aware of how I affect the people around me in other ways besides just physical accommodation, basically. Yeah. 
I love that you use the word contract. I think I think the mature path is just a, a path of being really transparent about what what is the contract that mm-hmm. is sort of underlying or underwriting this relationship and recognizing that we've all inherited a contract by virtue of our culture and tradition and society and, and the, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of years of the way things have been done. So like we're, we're, we're running on this sort of outdated template, but we still have the power, right. To rewrite this contract the way, the way we want it to. And I think, you know, there's, that's something for every couple to kind of figure out, you know, what, what is that balance of power, balance of responsibilities and so forth. And, you know, and I, and I think obviously like marriage and vows and, and all those things is sort of an attempt to, to outline that, but a lot of it, it kind of remains hidden. It, it's, it's invisible or implicit and that can become problematic. You know, it's not easy stuff to talk about, but it's, I find that again, if you want to have a sustainable and supportive relationship, then yeah, just making, making the contract visible and something open to discussion could go a long way. You're a wise man, Jeff. And with that, I want to pivot to the three things game. This is a knowledge and wisdom sharing game. So basically there's a prompt and then you give your answer of one, two, three. So what month is your birthday in? October. October. Okay. I'm up first because my birthday is sooner on the calendar. Here's my question. What are three things your childhood taught you? Wow. Okay. The first thing my childhood taught me was that I am great at conversation. <laughs> my my parents would have adults come up to them and, and say, wow, that kid can talk to me. That's remarkable. He's seven, you know, like have a conversation. And that was what sparked my interest in all of this and showed me that, you know, I have an aptitude for that and I should kind of lean into it. Secondly, my manners were instilled in me from a very young age. My mom, we give her a lot of... Uh, grief about it nowadays, joking around with her, but she was pretty strict with manners and and being polite. But that was one of the greatest gifts ever because that takes me very far. You know, just being genuine, being polite, being considerate, those things go a long way and people notice them. And lastly, just family, man. I absolutely love my family. So for me, that's one of the guiding principles of my life is just maintaining those relationships because there, it's kind of a very special thing that we have with, with our family. So those are the three things that my childhood taught me. And I will hold up, hold up your question here. All right. What are three things you have learned about commitment? Uh, what, a, what a great follow-up to the, the conversation about relationship and about marriage, you know. And I say marriage is, is in terms of commitment levels, um, you know, probably the, the most significant commitment I, I have made. I think number one is this might sound counterintuitive, but like, don't overthink it. Mm. I think there's only so far we can go with our rational, logical, analytical minds. And a lot of times when we have a big decision, we'll, we'll research the hell out of it and we'll weigh all the pros and cons. And we try to like break everything down into pluses and minuses. And, and, you know, I mean, you come up with a whole spreadsheet, you know, uh, (laughs) Right. But like at the end of the day, like the spreadsheet is not going to be the thing that tells you whether you should marry this person. There's there's more. <laughs> and this is, you know, and, and so it's like inviting in, inviting in your heart and your gut. Right. So it's like paying attention to that intuitive side of you, I think, is important. So I just think, you know, in terms of commitment, it's like, you know, listen, listen to your intuition as much as you listen to any sort of like rational analytical. I'm not saying get rid of the analytical part, but I'm saying bring in more of the intuitive part, I think is one about commitment. Uh, number two is that commitment isn't something that just happens once and it's over. Commitment, like so many things, is a daily practice, right? It is a every single day, a turning towards as opposed to turning away. It is a asking what's working and if it's working, then how can I strengthen it? And then, and if it's not working, like what, what can I do to, to remedy this? And I, and I think the, the thinking about commitment is an ongoing process um, is just, is really helpful because otherwise you can make an, a commitment one day and then the next day, right. It's like, there's no follow through. Everything starts falling apart, right? The commitment very ir- like easily deteriorates if you don't have that constant input of energy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I guess the, the third thing about commitment 
maybe sort of like piggybacking on on that last piece is that we we think of commitment as this sort of like set in stone thing. And this is true when you make that commitment, but I think there also needs to be a space to allow for growth. And I'm thinking of this mostly in interpersonal terms, you know, committing to another human. But like, I think the other, you know, even if you commit to yourself, like I'm going to, mm-hmm. I'm going to stop drinking, you know, mm-hmm. or I'm going to wake up and I'm going to exercise every single day for the next, you know, 60 days, right? Like that's a commitment to yourself. You want to uphold that, but like, you also need to allow your commitment to evolve as you evolve. Otherwise, or, or at least have regular check-ins. And this goes back to commitment being a process of asking, like, is this commitment as I had first articulated it still true, valid, and, and important? Because you might need to kind of update or revise the commitment as you grow. I love that. Yeah. And there's a certain amount of vulnerability and courage in that updating of a commitment too. Because maybe people's priorities change or they don't feel the same way about this idea as they felt previously. And that, that takes a certain amount of courage too, to be able to say, Hey, I'm not feeling the same about this right now. Or, you know, maybe it's a different feeling, but a stronger commitment, you know, it can, it can go anyway. So yeah, but yeah. It's very, <laughs> and it goes back to, again, making the invisible visible. I think there are certain things in our lives that we are committed to that we don't mm-hmm. even fully acknowledge or recognize and that some of those things are things that maybe we kind of committed to years ago and then like our lives change we've grown we've evolved and and they're not necessarily true anymore but we haven't gone back to like really test that assumption or ask that's the conscious path i suppose awesome jeff well thank you so much man this has been an absolute pleasure to speak with you where can the good people find your content and your services Super easy. Just Google my name, Jeff Siegel uh, Wellness, and you will come across my my website. And uh, I've got tons of articles on my blog about everything we talk about, like from nutrition to kind of lifestyle development to to, to health and wellness. Um, And again, thinking about wellness, you know, from this mental, emotional and physical perspective. And so just find me there. uh, Non-social, same thing, Jeff Siegel Wellness. Uh, you know, I want to just be in touch with, with anybody out there who like, if some part of this conversation resonated with you and you want to further it, then reach out and then, uh, I'd love to hear from you. Awesome, man. Thank you so much, Jeff. Have a great day. Thank you. There you have it, folks. Big thanks to Jeff. Head on over to jeffsegalwellness.com to find his services. He's a very insightful and inspiring person. And I really enjoyed what he had to say on this episode. And we'll see you next week on the Bro Nouveau podcast.